Thank you so much for joining us today for the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. Here on the Pastor's Potluck, it's similar to a normal potluck where you might get something that you want and there may be something that you just want to pass up altogether. And that's okay. There's something here for everybody. Our goal here is to encourage you and maybe in the process entertain you. If you're ready, let's dig in. Welcome to another episode of the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. Uh, We've been kind of teasing it a little bit for the last couple of weeks that we were going to have a special guest joining us. Um, Today we have Chaplain Major Justin Elliott joining us today for the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. He's with the West Virginia National Guard, the Army division of it, Mm -hmm. or the Army side of things. Dude. We finally made it happen. <laughs> like today's here. <laughs> hey, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, Thank man. you for having me on. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get to know your story a little bit. We're also joined by Pastor Scott. Um, I feel like I'm way underdressed <laughs> sitting next to you in your, in your, in your <laughs> army outfit. This is my everyday uniform. Really? Is it, is it like breathe really good? No. No? no it is hot. <laughs> Dang it. Doesn't stretch well. Yeah, but right. I don't have to choose what I have to wear in the morning, so it makes life a little easier. Yeah, well, I mean, and if it gets wrinkly, the camouflage hides the wrinkles, right? Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> so the old uniforms, you had to iron them. Yeah. So a lot of guys grew up doing that. I came in with this uniform. They say, do not iron it. So I, I think I got off pretty lucky. Oh, man, that sounds like a program I want to be a part of. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, no ironing. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's awesome, man. Um, I'm like. But yeah, we we talked about this for a little bit, uh, you and I, and communications, and then uh, summer happened, and then people coming and going. But I'm I'm glad that you're finally here to to sit down with this because um, you're a pastor, chaplain. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and so first off, I want to get to know you just a little bit. Um, have you always lived in West Virginia or where were you like, where were you born and raised? Where was your childhood and life spent? Yeah. So born and raised in West Virginia, actually up in a town called Bridgeport. So if you're familiar with the state, we're North central there, but, uh, yeah, been there since I was a child. And funny enough, my wife and I, we moved away for college down to Lynchburg, Virginia, Liberty university, ended up moving back and, uh, didn't go too far ended up living a mile from my childhood house in her childhood house. So, Oh, that's crazy. (laughs) Very close. Yeah. So, um, so you spent most of your life here and then you went to Liberty. Now, were you already enlisted in, in the military before you went to Liberty university or was that after? So I did a semester there at Liberty university and just two days after Christmas, December 27th is when I enlisted in the West Virginia army national guard. Okay. Yeah. Nice. How long have you been in the National Guard? Coming up on 17 years now. Holy cow. How old are you? Yeah, I get that question all the time. (laughs) Yeah, I just turned 36. Dude, you're younger than I am. Wow, 17 years. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of your fair share of stories, right? Like senior. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. As a chaplain, there's there's not much I haven't heard or seen. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, have you served Jesus like your whole life uh, or did you like, I like to call it my building, my testimony years. Um, did you have like a, a like a, a section of your life where you were just like, I'm just going to do my own thing. Like t- walk us through like what your faith journey looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So I wish I had that testimony where I could say, yes, at five years old, I professed Jesus Christ as my Lord and savior. Yeah. Uh, but it took me a little bit to get there. I'm a slow, slow learner there, but I ended up, uh, you know, my family, you know, tried to do the right thing. We would go to church from time to time as I was growing up, never really connected with me at all. Yeah. Uh, rolled into that transition between middle school and high school. And that's where everybody's trying to find their sense of identity, their sense of purpose. And that was an area where I really struggled. Uh, So I started self isolating from my, my family, from my friends and really just had a a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was at that point, I just turned 15 years old that a friend brought me to church because she saw that I needed some help, right? She knew I needed Jesus. I didn't know it. Yeah. And so I was like, well, yeah, I guess I'll go, you know, just kind of hesitantly and ended up going there. And it was just an amazing Bible church, uh, contemporary service. But as I'm looking around and I'm seeing everybody worship 
out there in the audience and just connecting with the music, connecting with God. And I just saw how beautiful it was. And I realized that there is something huge missing in my life that everybody else around me had. And so I went to church, you know, the next week and the next week, and the next week. And then finally the Lord put it on my heart that, Hey, I'm the answer. You're, I'm what you're looking for. Yeah. And so I sought out the youth pastor, uh, Chris Campbell, uh, that morning down there in the, the youth group room, he led me to Jesus. And that's mm. really like my origin story from that point forward, you know, going to church, mm. I was, uh, I pretty much had a residence there because I was there the yeah. Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service, uh, the, uh, the youth ministry services, uh, ended up getting involved with the, the auto visual aspect of it. So I started serving in that respect. So I was there pretty much all throughout the week. Yeah. I was like, anytime the doors were open, like that's similar to me and Scott's like yeah. anytime the, the church door was open, his, his dad actually was a, a pastor at a church. And so they lived in a parsonage on the property. Yeah. There's and, no getting away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I was, uh, say we had a drug problem. It's our mom and dad drug us to church <laughs> every single time the doors were open. We were there. I remember some Sundays, Sunday school, Sunday morning, mm -hmm. a luncheon, a gospel sing service that night. Yeah. Wow. It was unreal how much we went to church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It almost like for me, it was like putting like this, this disdain for church. I was like, gosh. Sometimes I just don't, I'd rather go to what, oh, yeah. where, where y'all trying to get people into. I was like, I want to go somewhere else, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> this going to church all the time was, it was, I mean, just for a young person, but you know, I was young and immature and, um, my story is a little bit of, um, I moved from Louisiana to Texas whenever I was 14. And so I, I spiraled out of control, um, at that point. And, um, but yeah, later on in life. Uh, I met my wife and, uh, we ended up, uh, having a baby the same, or she was pregnant the, within a month of us being together and we're like, oh, okay, we got to get in church. Like, you know, just, I mean, I, I had done enough and, and seen enough and gone through enough and, uh, I was tired of running. I knew that yeah. God was, was calling, calling me to be in a relationship with him, um, and, to to follow him and serve him and. It, it, it just got to a point to where it, it was just unmistakable what I, what I needed to do. I needed to, I needed to get back to, to doing what he created me for. And that was to serve and worship him. And, uh, I've, I've loved it every day since then. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, we can only run for so long before, you know, we finally feel that in our hearts where we recognize, Hey, I, I got to quit running. Yeah. Now when you enlisted, like 42 decades ago, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, you said 16, 17 years. Yeah. 17 years, 17 yeah. years ago. Now when you enlisted were, was it a plan to become the chaplain of so, the national guard here in West Virginia? No, definitely not. No. Uh, and not initially. So I got in as a 42 alpha, which is a human resource specialist. So okay. a paperwork shuffler. Uh, and I, I did a lot of that because it came with a bonus uh, and it helped you with college, yeah. which if you've ever gone to a private out of state college, you realize it's not free. No, it's yeah. expensive. Yeah. So the national guard really helped me out there. Did me a solid, but I, I, uh, enlisted during that time and I remember signing the paperwork and they, they give you like the date, like this is the date that you can get out your, mm -hmm. the end of your contract. And I looked at, it, I was like, that date's not even real. Like it was eight yeah. years down the road. I was like, how am I going to make it? and uh, ended up shipping off to basic and advanced individual, advanced individual training that following summer. And when I was there in basic, you know, they put you in this bay of 70 guys and just wide open and they're from all walks of life. And I looked around and I saw that everybody was there because they were running from something. They were searching for something to be part of that was bigger than themselves. Yeah. Uh, they saw the answer as being the army. I saw the answer as like, wow, these guys need God. Yeah. Uh, so I was in a really incredible position there and being able to pray with these guys and share scripture. And while we were there, uh, of course there are chaplains that are there basic training. And I got to see the, the ministry and the privilege that these chaplains had to just walk into soldiers lives, no matter having no idea who they are, where they're coming from, but just to be Jesus to them in that yeah. moment and to offer up that strength and to encourage them in their faith. And as I was there in that bay, I remember, I just felt God really put it on my heart. Like, 
this is where I want you to serve. Yeah. Uh, so coming out of high school, I knew for a fact that God was going to put me in the ministry. I just didn't know what that looked like. Yeah. And it took that moment for me to come to that realization, like, wow, God, this is where, where you want me. Yeah. That's incredible. Like I, I, I know I've got a ton of friends that have gone in the military and, and they're out now and some still in it. And it, it, it's so true. Exactly what you were saying. They were, they're running from something. They wanted to be a part of something that was bigger than themselves and be a part of a team. And, um, I don't, maybe there's some recruiting tactics, but we won't get into that <laughs> with the conversations that they have. But, um, it was a lot of these guys didn't really know what they wanted to do mm-hmm. in life. And they just said, you know what, I can get my college paid for, you know, might as well go sign up and be a part of the military and, uh, being around them a lot, you, you kind of, you kind of get this window into this lifestyle that, uh, a lot of them do end up falling down and it's, Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of alcohol, a lot of, uh, things that are just not reflective of, of Jesus. Um, but they don't know any better as well. And so, I, it, I find it so intriguing for individuals like yourself and chaplains all across the country um, that have this incredible opportunity just to share Jesus with people mm-hmm. and, and share hope. Um, it, it's, it's needed, you know, our soldiers need Jesus just as much as I do, just as much as anybody else. Um, and uh, it's an incredible opportunity uh, for you to be able to do that. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and maybe you can maybe share a little bit of this too, because you, you deal with this with people just coming up to the church every single week as well. How do we, how do you approach ministering to people that, that come from different walks of faith? Because in the military, it's almost kind of like this melting pot. Yeah. Um, it may not be so much here, but I know that you get a lot of questions, pastor Mm -hmm. Scott as well from, you know, maybe someone who's a a, a former Buddhist or, you know, someone who's a Catholic and, and how do we, how do we approach those conversations to, to share with them the true gospel, you know, the, the true message of who Jesus is. I'll let you go first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the military is this cross section of the American people, right? So a lot of ministers and pastors they they come into the chaplaincy thinking i'm going to be a pastor and i'm going to do great things and spread the gospel and they quickly realize that because it's this cross section there's only a small population that would consider themselves to be devout christians and living in their faith there's a large majority that have zero faith there's a large majority that have walked away from christianity and then of course you have all these different other religions that are also in that big melting pot you have buddhism like you mentioned Norse pagan is one that we've seen really kind of take off over the last few years. Uh, Muslim soldiers. I mean, just all walks of life, different faith traditions. And as a chaplain, you know, we walk around with the the cross on our chest. I didn't even notice that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So a definite, now you know what to look for. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, so Christian chaplains, we wear that cross. So when we walk around, you know, we are the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal. So we could be the only person in this in these soldiers lives uh, that can represent Jesus to them Mm. Um, and so when they approach us for any kind of spiritual guidance any kind of questions which we're like the multi-tool in the military like we handle everything if there's any kind of issue whatsoever the the go-to response from commanders is did you talk to the chaplain go talk to the chaplain he'll figure it out but yeah so they know what they're coming into when they come speak to us and if they say hey you know I'm not Christian but you know I need your advice on this issue I mean, they're going to get advice and whether or not they know it, it's going to be Christian because that is what I base my morals, my values, my, my compass on in my entire life. And I'm not going to quote scripture to them, but they're going to get the truth. Yeah. yeah. And for you, Scott, like I know that yeah. you've had several conversations with people from different walks of life. Like, yeah. how do you, like, how do you approach those types of conversations? Yeah. I think the, the biggest thing for me is <clears throat> I, I realize at the end of the day that I am not the savior. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have to feel like personally responsible in that moment for, for that. And, and so I can also be pretty welcoming and accommodating regardless of where they're coming from. Cause I don't, again, I don't have to, um, be hard nosed in that conversation whatsoever. Like yeah. we, I can allow them to sh- share what they think 
And and it's not – and this is where I think I wish more people could get there, which is it's okay that you, you can be open-minded in a conversation mm-hmm. without actually – having what I believe ever affected yeah. whatsoever. Um, Cause people don't always have to agree with me to have a good conversation. I think that's probably the key um, to dealing with a bunch of diverse people is letting them be who they are in that moment. Yeah. And we'll leave everything else up to God. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, whether you're a pastor or a chaplain um, being comfortable in your faith, is everything to be able yeah. to have those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. So as a chaplain, all these different walks of life. There's not like chaplains for different faith backgrounds. There's just one. Is that correct? Uh, No. So there are different backgrounds for chaplains. Uh, So like I said, I'm a Christian chaplain. We also have uh, Catholic chaplains. We had one here in the state uh, this past year, which he went on to active duty. Okay. Uh, Jewish rabbis who are chaplains. Uh, We also have, uh, I met a Buddhist chaplain at one point in my career. And then some of these smaller sects like uh, like LDS, they have chaplains as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So is there, I know you said that when you're having those discussions, you may not quote scripture. Mm-hmm. Is there restrictions on that? Or does everyone that come to you know, no, this is the Christian guy, like he's representing Jesus in the Bible, mm-hmm. or is there restrictions? Yeah. So that we know there's an understanding, obviously, like, hey, I'm talking to the chaplain. He is the religious specialist here. Um, where he's coming from is going to impact what he says to me. Sure. But on the chaplain side of the house, we we are restricted from uh, proselytizing. Sure. Right. So we're not going out and, you know, into crowds of soldiers and saying, you need Jesus or you're going to go to hell. Like you need to be baptized right now. Uh, nothing like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But if we have a soldier coming to us and they are seeking, you know, that in their life, they're ready to make that decision. Absolutely. I'm going to walk you down the Romans road and, and we're going to yeah. have that moment together. Wow. Um, are you, I assume, do you, do you attend a local church whenever you're not, um, well, you guys have drill the first weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I have, I am the full-time chaplain for the state of West Virginia. So I do this day in and day out. Okay, yeah, yeah. So not just drill weekends. Right, right. Um, but we, my family's up in Bridgeport. Uh, so my home church is up there as well. So I, okay. I'm down here in the week at JFHQ, sure. our joint force headquarters in Charleston, um, about half the time, roughly. Yeah. Gotcha. So are you able to encourage folks that come to you to attend local churches, things mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have eight chaplains across the state. Only two of us are, are in the full-time positions there. Uh, but several of those chaplains have local churches. Yeah. And we're able to encourage them like, hey, you know, you may want to check this church out. Yeah. Or cool. if, if they don't like that church or maybe they're of a different denomination, uh, that pastor will be able to like reference and, and point you in the right direction for other options. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you is, um, what are some of the unique spiritual challenges that service members face? Obviously, you know, you've got the, with the national guard, there's, it's, there's tons of training. There's all, all, you know, natural disasters It's like, what are some of those challenges that you're, that you're seeing some of the soldiers that are going through, um, in relation to like what they have to do? Like, is there, I mean, I'm kind of curious about this life, you know, this military life, because first off, I appreciate it. You know, I, I thank you for serving our great state. And anytime that they call on y'all, y'all are, y'all are always going and making things happen. And, um, you know, just, we would be a disaster without y'all guys. I mean, y'all help out so much with like natural responses and stuff, but, um, like what are some of those, those spiritual challenges that people are facing? Like, what are they going through? Like in, 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 in relation to the military life that they're living? Yeah. So one of the unique experiences of being in the military is just how often that fi- family dynamic is kind of set off balance. Mm. Uh, so like you said, like we're, we get called to do stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, the typical National Guardsman, yeah, you have the, the one week in a month and the two months in the summer, you know, as you saw in the commercials. But there's so much more than that. They don't tell you, like, hey, you have to go to military schools or there could be deployments yeah. and all these other additional trainings and things that pop up. And so with that, if your family is not on board, because it's not just a service member that signs up, it's the entire family. Yeah. Uh, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Um, but if not everybody's on board, that can cause some huge issues within the family dynamic. Yeah. Uh, divorce uh, rates are very high within the military. 
And then you have issues with, you know, children having to cope with parents being gone for long amounts of time. Mm. And so that's probably the biggest spiritual pain mm. right there is that, you know, the, the family that, you know, loves you and supports you, they are just struggling to keep things together. And that, that heartache, that distance, uh, wanting to, you know, to be at home, you know, despite the fact that you have to answer your nation's call, it's very challenging to deal with. Uh, we especially see that on deployments. Yeah, it's one of those things that you just don't, you don't have like a, a whole lot of information on or, or maybe you're, you haven't been, your eyes haven't been opened up to that issue because, you know, nobody hardly talks about those things. Mm-hmm. And so it's a great way for, you know, just myself and my family just to be able to pray for the service members of our country. Um, the men and women who just give so much of their time and literally sacrifice um, so much uh, for freedoms and for safety um, for all of us here in America. And you just you just think, oh, I'm just going to go run around and do some jogging and some push-ups. But <laughs> the fact that you say that, you know, you've got to be deployed or you've got to go off and get some training or you've got to be out for, you know, two months out of the summer and every single um, first weekend of the month, you know, like they're gone, you know, because they've got drill and all these other things. Um, it, I, I can imagine that the family dynamic does take a, it takes a, a drastic hit. Mm-hmm. Does the chaplain position, um, is that, uh, sometimes deployed? Yeah, absolutely. So every battalion and every brigade within the West Virginia National Guard is assigned a chaplain and those units deploy. Uh, so I deployed, well, with the cavalry regiment back in 2019 through 2020 over to the Middle East. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we have a, a few deployments coming up here over the next few years, and we'll have chaplains that go out with those units as well. Sure. So what do you, when you're on deployment, what does that look like in comparison to your normal chaplain duties? So uh, essentially the same exact duties, just at a very high op tempo is what we call it. Yeah. Uh, so you know, 24-7, you are living with, uh, if you're at the battalion level, you know, five, 600 soldiers, and you are responsible for providing that religious and spiritual care for them. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we see on deployments nowadays are behavioral health struggles. And so you have soldiers walk into your, into your office every single day saying, hey, I'm depressed. This is what I'm dealing with. You know, I'm missing a home or, you know, my wife, you know, wants a divorce, just all kinds of different issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, as a chaplain overseas, you're doing everything you know, that I'm doing on the full time side, just at a much higher rate. So you are doing chapel services, you're doing Bible studies. Uh, counseling day in and day out and then you're also monitoring the morale of the Mm -hmm. unit and when you see things start to struggle uh, and I'll give you an example there so in 2020 we're coming to the tail end of my deployment and and what happened in 2020 pandemic yeah pandemic right Mm -hmm. so we're overseas and all of a sudden this thing called COVID just upsets everything so whereas we were conducting all these operations across the you know the the Middle East there you know, these units start to get pulled back and we get stuck in place. Uh, the local nationals who provided us the basic services, such as haircuts or running the, the, the PX uh, to where we buy snacks or running the gyms, all that stuff got shut down for a period of time. And so soldiers uh, with nothing to do and uh, really losing that sense of meaning and purpose on why they are there from their families during yeah. this pandemic period, uh, it really weighed on them. And so as a chaplain, I looked around and, and I tried to find different ways that I can engage uh, these guys and gals to keep their, their morale up, to keep them their heads in the game so they don't you know, just sit there and kind of wallow in the, the difficult circumstances we're in. And fortunately, I had a very good commander who was willing to just let me run with it. Uh, so I had several different ideas. Uh, I started a marathon uh, training team. So I had a good group of soldiers, probably about 20 or 30 of us, who every day we would run together. Um, and just for months at a time and with the end goal of running a marathon back in Morgantown when we got back, uh, we also did a, a Bible reading streak. So we, for the month of May, I want to say it was, we re- read through the, the book of Proverbs and, and just all these other different little ideas to keep soldiers engaged, to keep them encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you do chapel services whenever on deployment, do you do that here as well? Uh, yeah, so uh, most weekends I am doing a chapel service all across the state, and it's nothing, no fancy production like you would have at your, your regular church, sure. but all the elements are still there. So, you know, we'll sing a song, we'll have 
prayer time and praise time as well as sharing a message. And that could be anywhere from, you know, a tiny chapel that we have there at our Joint Force headquarters. It could be in a classroom at a random armory or the back of a Humvee. I mean, it, it, I mean it's a really amazing kind of ministry. Sure. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's like, um, it reminds me of like missions trips almost. So I've been on several of them and it's like, it, Hey, whatever, whatever you got to do to make it work, let's make it work because I think it's important to share Jesus. You know, that's why we came all the way across the country. Um, uh, another question I want to ask you is, um, how has being a chaplain influenced your understanding of concepts like sacrifice and resilience and purpose? Um, because I mean, you get to see it like firsthand with your day-to-day job, quote unquote, but also what you're reading in the Bible as well. Um, do you feel like you've got like a, a I don't want to say, say like better grasp, but I feel like you probably would have a better grasp of those meanings of words because like you said, you've been deployed, you've seen what sacrifice looks like. Uh, you see what purpose, um, you know, can, can feel like in being a part of a team. So um, I just was curious about that because I mean, there's some commonalities between the word of God and the military life, you know, with sacrifice being one of them, like, especially. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, sacrifice is, it's no stranger to us in the military whatsoever and dealing with resilience and, yeah, I mean, sacrifice, it's kind of like the, the bread and butter for the chaplain, right? Because that is the, the daily struggle that we see all yeah. the time. And I am very fortunate. I tell people all the time, like, if I didn't have Jesus, I'd have nothing. Yeah. Um, I couldn't imagine having to serve in the military and to not have any kind of faith and to go through those deployments and to see and experience all this trauma overseas and just the even the mundane things that you go through as soldiers. Like, I couldn't imagine it without my faith. That's what grounds me. And that's really what kind of centers it becomes a center focus on a lot of my messages and bible studies and prayer breakfast and everything else yeah. uh, because i see the biggest need we have in the military right now is to maintain that resiliency that spiritual resiliency so mm. any way that i can pull scripture and share that with another soldier i mean it's um you know i think it's a win for the gospel it's a win for the for kingdom sure. yeah now, are there any things like any challenges that you are facing right now that like, cause we have quite obviously quite a few people from uh, Southridge church, but this is, um, it, I think that this episode is going to do really well because there's a whole lot of back end stuff that's going to happen with the national guard and mm-hmm. the, just, a, the, just some really good exposure. But for other people who are listening to this, what can we do as, um, as Christ followers, help partner with you with the national guard and, and, and the role that you are in. Um, and is there, is there anything specific that we can pray for? Is there any kind of need that we can just bring to light and, um, believe that God's going to take care of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So prayer obviously is the first and foremost. Um, I believe in the power of prayer and I've seen God do wonderful things by answering prayer Mm -hmm. and certainly our soldiers and uh, our airmen as well in the West Virginia National Guard. uh, We need all the prayer that we can get. Um, And, you know, to just pray for our family units, to pray for that resilience, pray for that mental health, uh, for good leadership that's making decisions that are in the best interest of our service members. I think those are all just a great starting point. And then if you encounter a service member just be willing to you know pray for him in that moment yeah absolutely yeah that's good uh I, or give me a whole bunch of your business cards man I'll be like, hey go, you need to go hit this guy up really quick all right uh we are at the part of our um podcast episode where we have a little <laughs> you probably have been looking forward to this haven't you i have yeah yeah <laughs> so we have a segment called the mystery meet and it's just like any other potluck that you go to and um you just don't know what the dish is and so you take a scoop of it you put it on your plate you go sit back down Mm -hmm. it may be something that you are really excited for or you're just completely disappointed in but that is the name of this game (laughs) uh some of the questions are good some of them are not so good (laughs) like Like a potluck yeah just like just like a potluck (laughs) just like a potluck so mixy mixy here we go all right uh, if you could, 
If you could switch lives with any fictional character for a week, who would it be and why? <laughs> oh my goodness, a fictional character? Scrooge McDuck. I'm swimming in you money. You want to swim in gold? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's pretty solid. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen coins turn into liquid the way that he can swim through them coins. I mean, I've seen some people try to jump on stuff and it hurts. <laughs> Just for a week? Uh, that's the tough part. Yeah. I want a permanent switch. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Or, dude, what about this? Did you remember that movie uh, with Macaulay Culkin growing up? Richie Rich. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Because, like, he had all the toys and the gadgets. He even had a roller coaster in his backyard. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Like, I, I'm trying to think of, like, what I would do. Like, some of the places that are the people I would, like, oh, I want that whenever I was, like, a kid. Because right now, I don't want to switch anything. I like my life. You know, my wife and, and my kids are good and... I don't know. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to swing big on this one. I say, I want, how about Rambo? Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you know, most of what he did was fictional and in, in the army, like when you enlist, you think like, Hey, those are things I'm going to do. I'm going to go be Rambo and yeah. you know, shoot a machine gun from the hip and everything. Why not? You know, go have that full experience <laughs> for a week. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That's uh didn't they make like a Rambo versus predator movie? I think they did actually. Yeah. yeah they just, any way they can make money out of that one. franchise. Oh, dude, they were, <laughs> they were milking them so bad. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to do that, that movie universe. I don't want to fight. Yeah. What you got? Oh, gosh. Uh, the first thing that popped into my head, and I don't even know why, was Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, that would be fun. That <laughs> would be fun. Well, it depends on which week of his life. I yeah, think. it depends <laughs> on which movie. Um, definitely one of the older versions of him. Yeah, yeah. But, no, I think that, I don't know, either that or anyone with, like, superpowers would be fun. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, Iron Man. Yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. Like if you could be, uh, yeah. but I don't want to be Iron Man. I want to be the, what's what's his name? Uh, why can I not? Tony Stark? Yes, I want to be Tony Stark. You don't want to. You don't want the suit and the. And no, the I just want all the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the gigantic tower to live in. Yeah, and then the ability to put a suit on and fly around would be fun. Well, I mean, I guess you could be Batman too. You know, he's, yeah, Batman. He's loaded. Batman. I would be down with Batman. Yeah. Lots of money, and uh, a cool hangout. Um, I'd be down with any of the the superheroes. Would be fun. Yeah, probably Superman though. Because uh, then you can yeah, go you fly. Can fly yeah. yeah, you, you can Superman go fly. Superman is out my space. least favorite su superhero ever. So like, I oppose him. What about Aquaman? I'm okay with Aquaman. What I don't like about Superman is he has no limits, which is just silly. Oh, I know. I love it's it. It's like we created a superhero. What's he do? Everything. Yeah, because it's the the question is is like if you're going and swapping places for a week, Superman actually in Superman two, the old movie with Christopher Reeves. Um, God rest his soul. He's the best Superman ever. <laughs> Anyways, uh, he, um, in Superman two, Lois Lane dies. And so what he does is he flies up into outer space yeah. and then he flies That's around so the earth silly. in the opposite direction and it starts spinning in the opposite direction. And so time starts going back so he could save her. Terrible. I would do that. Yep. And then I would like yeah. for, it would be like, like Dormammu. Yeah. I'm Superman, here to make a bargain. Superman is the lamest premise ever. No, he's he has the best. everything. You can, and then they're like, all right, well, since we made him literally indestructible, he can fly, he can do everything. What's his weakness? Oh, probably this little green rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dumbest premise of anything ever. It did, like, it the was... thing I like about Batman is he can die. Yeah, yeah. like you can hurt him. Superman yeah. died. I have the comic with the green rock. Um, he got weakened by uh, the green a character rock. called Doomsday. Yeah, and Doomsday beat it's, him up. That, that's silly. Batman that's not can silly. Batman can legitimately, without like, he doesn't have like, oh, there's this rock from this one planet, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. he can get shot. <laughs> yeah, Batman's always been my favorite for that reason. Yeah. Like, he's just a legit dude who was out there fighting crime. Yeah, like, Spider very human man aspect. can die. Yeah, like all these other ones can absolutely die. <laughs> <laughs> Superman can't die. Like he just he, he has everything. It's like he's the man of steel. You shoot guns at him and just you can't do it. Yeah. That's a silly, really silly premise. I don't know how he's so popular. He's my least favorite. 
Yeah. I oh, think I it's his calm, cool demeanor, like which is totally opposite of you describing his life situation. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, it is. I just I do not like uh, Superman at but all. You also got to think like whenever he was created to was like in the 40s. Mm-hmm. So that was like whenever like people were walking around talking like, "Ah, oh, you see old Curly Robinson from the batter's box," you know, like talking about like these old yeah. Like it was like the, the what they consider like the golden age of comics. Like it's like this is long Worst. time ago. Did they ever explain why he had a job? Like if I were yeah. Superman, like I wouldn't <laughs> yeah. have a job. Yeah, why, why did he work at the newspaper <laughs> yeah, of all so places? Good. Yeah, like it's not like he needed money. <laughs> that is so good. And it's really also it's very silly that for some reason a guy that doesn't wear a mask. You don't know that it's him just because he doesn't have his glasses. <laughs> hey, on. that looks like Clark. You, I saw him writing a yeah, newspaper. I'm there, fairly there. certain <laughs> if you came in tomorrow without your glasses on, I'm gonna know who you are. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Superman's the worst. Yeah, that the is worst. a pretty dumb. I'm, I'll I'm give dying you that. on this mountain right here. <laughs> the job, <laughs> the job was the pretty worst. funny, and then the glasses. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty dumb. I'm taking like Captain Planet over Superman <laughs> <laughs> any day. The molars just, are coming back. Yeah, yeah, it's like I'm doing all of any. I will take some of the bad guys over Superman. <laughs> Dude, you know what sucks about Captain Planet though is because like. Realistically, think about. Do you have kids? I do. Yeah. How many kids do you have? We've got three. There's seven, four, and two. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, this is going to resonate with all of us. Captain Planet had to rely on six, five, five kids, right? Five mm-hmm. kids to hold up a ring and say, you know, this, this, this cheerleader song, you know, Earth, Wind, Fire, Wind, Water, Heart, whatever, all that stuff. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't remember the the no. cartoon Captain Planet? Well, no. I didn't watch superhero stuff growing up. I only got into superheroes whenever they started the MCU. All right. So and now I'm out on it because they started all the multiverse stuff. And I just think that that's dumb. So this, it was this cartoon. And so these kids had these rings mm-hmm. and they had to summon Captain Planet whenever they couldn't figure it out themselves. Kids mm-hmm. held on to these rings like they didn't lose them at all. Like if you were Captain Planet, there would yeah. be a point where you're like, and they haven't called me out in a while. Because, that's how they summon him? Yeah. Yeah, they put yeah. their rings together. That sounds terrible. Yeah. And I still go with him over Superman. <laughs> <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying, though? Like, it yeah, would be like wild. less than a week before my kids would lose that dumb ring. No before. kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, dude, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the conversation. Um, yes. We will be praying for you. Um, you, so, uh, you have my contact information. Yeah. If there's anything else that comes up. Um, that you need us to pray for, um, let us know. We'll let our people here at Southridge know we want to partner with you in ministry um, any which way possible that we can um, because it is important, the work that you are doing. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that anybody that, that, that obeys the call that God has put on their lives to share the gospel with, any, with anybody by any means necessary um, doesn't matter if they're Baptist, Methodist, Church of God folks, you know, we need a, we're all on the same team. We're all, we're all pointing people to the same Jesus. And so, um, we'll be praying for you. Like I said, let us know of anything. Um, and this is your first podcast, right? This is my first podcast. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you for the opportunity for being here to, to share my message, to share what the, the chaplain corps is like. And it's a, this tremendous ministry um, that few are called to, but if you are feeling that tug in your heart, like answer it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, if I hadn't had that when I was in basic training, you know, I, I don't know what I'd be doing, Yeah. but, uh, to be able to serve God in the military in this unique aspect to be like a missionary in this type of work, yeah. it's, it's so fulfilling the, the long days, the traveling, being away from the family, all the sacrifices you have to make at the end of the day, it's worth it because you're doing what God's called you to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited to hear those stories, man. We'll keep in touch for sure. But uh, thank y'all for joining us for this episode of the Pastor's Potluck. Uh, We'll see you next time for another episode. Thank you so much for listening in with us today. We really appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, You can also watch the video version of this on YouTube as well. All you have to do is search up the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. From all of us here, we want to say thank you 
and we'll see you next week.